945 uh, each Sunday morning. Um, we will have a church supper for the first time since February. Uh, we're going to have a, a church supper on November 1st. Uh, that'll be at 5 o'clock. Uh, that will be at uh, Roger Dale and Suzette's house. Uh, and they, we're going to have an outside uh, church supper. Uh, we're going to have a fish fry. And uh, the church is going to provide... Uh, the church is going to provide the food um, in that um, the pots are going to do a lot of fish frying, uh, but we want to do this in a way that <clears throat> is safe, uh, and so we're, uh, we're going to have a serving line, and, uh, and we are going to have, uh, we're not going to have, it's not going to be potluck, you guys don't get a chance to bring cool things, uh, but we would love to uh, to have a chance to fellowship uh, and uh, around uh, some food together. Uh, that will be on November 1st uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, at the Potts family house in uh, Sautilla. There are some directions on the uh, podium on the back if you need uh, directions to their house. And so we'll announce that again next week, but uh, November 1st um, at, uh, at the Potts house. Uh, also, uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the hallway. Uh, we're, we want to provide some meals for <clears throat> the Gregory family uh, coming up uh, in the next week or so. And uh, so we would uh, just encourage uh, you to, uh, to, uh, to sign up for that. And if you need any details on that, please see Julie. Uh, and uh, we would like to uh, provide some meals uh, for, uh, for their family. Um, also, just a reminder that Samar we are collecting Samaritan's Purse items. Uh, and there's a, a basket in the hallway, and we just encourage you to, to bring those with you when you come and, and drop them off. And uh, we want to have just a, 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 be able to fill a lot of boxes. The church is going to pay for the, the shipping on those boxes, and so we would just encourage you to, to be a part of that outreach and a chance to really share the love of Christ with some young people we'll never meet. Uh, this side of heaven, uh, and so we just uh, ask you to be a part of that. Um, are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? I would invite your attention to the screen behind me. Um, the meditation passage for this morning as we ask the Lord to prepare our hearts to worship Him uh, is Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. The call to worship for this morning is from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and is not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. 
Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge the truth of this particular psalm, that the earth is yours. Everything that in it is yours. We are yours. Uh, You have uh, made us. Uh, You created us. Uh, You sustain us. And so, God, I pray as we come together in this place this morning, I pray you would would draw our attention, our focus uh, to who you are, and, and, and what you are like, and what you have done. I pray that you would cause us to think uh, about you and, and your glory. And I pray you would cause us to respond appropriately to that, that we would respond in worship, uh, that you would draw our focus away from ourselves uh, and, and, and to you. And God, I pray that our worship this morning would be pleasing and honoring to you. You are are so worthy uh, of so much more than we can give you. So I pray by your grace and your mercy, you would accept our worship of you today. We we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We worship a God who can speak a word and galaxies come into being. So let's stand together this morning and Use our voices at the top of our lungs to sing hymn 379 and worship him. Come thou fount of every blessing. Let's stand together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Last week in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we considered uh, whether our first parents, Adam and Eve, continued in the estate wherein they were created, and we answered that they did not. Uh, Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the estate wherein they were created, and they did so by sinning against God. And so our question this week follows by asking, what is sin? And and the answer that we're given, as you can see behind me, is sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So that phrase, the want want of conformity, uh, that's just old language for what we might say as a lack of, 
a lack of conformity, meaning, of course, that anything that we do that doesn't conform to or comply with the law of God is sin. And transgression, that's a word that shows up in our Bibles, and it's synonymous often with rebellion. Uh, is, it means that it, it, to know what's expected of us and then to knowingly refuse to do it or to do something else entirely is a transgression against the law of God and is sin. So sin is any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. Now, in our answer, we see sin described both in terms of passive disobedience and active disobedience. And sometimes we speak of sin in, in two categories, sins of commission and sins of omission. You may have heard that language before. Uh, so sins of commission, these are things that God tells us not to do in his word. And when we do these things anyway, we're committing sin. And so sins of commission. Sins of omission uh, in a passive way. When God tells us in his word that we must do certain things and then we fail to do those things for whatever reason, we're guilty of what we then call sins of omission. And that leads us to another question. And it's one that you might have heard me ask before because I, I, I tend to ask it a lot. I think it really drives home the point of our pervasive sinfulness so well. And the question is, if someone were to ask you, what do you think is the greatest sin? What would come to mind? You might think about an act of violence or some other terrible thing. And while the Bible does tell us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And as R.C. Sproul has said, all sin is cosmic treason. There are sins that are more wicked than others. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 6 tells us about seven sins that the Lord explicitly hates. They include haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Uh, the scripture tells us explicitly that God hates those sins. But back to the question that I posed. If there is a greatest sin, wouldn't it make sense that it would be to break the greatest commandment? And what do we know that the greatest commandment is? Jesus tells us in Mark 12 that the greatest commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. And surely to break the greatest commandment would be to commit the greatest sin, right? Right? And the reality is that there has never been a single moment in your life when you have perfectly loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, making us all guilty continually of committing what we might call the greatest sin by breaking the greatest commandment. But the good news, however which we've been called together this morning as God's people to hear again and again and to celebrate and to rejoice in is that there was never a moment in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ when he did not perfectly love the Lord his God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, and all of his strength. And that when we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to us in the gospel, the guilt of our sin is taken away by his death, and, the, and then his life of perfect righteousness is counted forever by God as having been ours. So just as if we had never failed to love the Lord our God perfectly in thought and in deed. And the wonderful thing is that by the work of the Spirit in the believer, we are enabled, not perfectly, but genuinely, to more and more love the Lord our God with our hearts and with our minds as we think about these things and with our strength as we then go and, and try to live to the glory of God. And one day, that love will be perfected when we see him face to face in the new heavens and the new earth. And so we celebrate that certain future uh, and the certain hope that we have in it 
on this Lord's Day and every Lord's Day. It's a foretaste of the glory that is to come because of what Christ has done for his people. Now finally, the Bible does tell us about one unforgivable sin, uh, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which Jesus himself tells us will not be forgiven. So the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, what is it? Well, it is simply to reject the redeeming love of God that comes to us again and again through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there can be no forgiveness for that sin because the very act of committing it is to continue to refuse to accept the full and the free forgiveness that is offered to all of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would urge you, each of you this morning, whether for the first time or for the millionth time, to believe the gospel and to rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to us, as we sing the gospel and pray the gospel together, and as our minister in just a little while preaches the gospel to us again on this Lord's Day, today is this, the day of salvation. So let's say the catechism together now. What is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Thank you again, Matt. Let's stand together and sing the mighty power of God, hymn 84. We'll sing all three verses. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that life from thee is ever in thy care and everywhere that man can be thou God art present there as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I would like to encourage us from Psalm 139. Uh, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 10, uh, reminds us of how intimately acquainted with each one of us God is. Uh, I think one of the fears, if we're honest, that we live with is being found out. You know, that folks will find out about us and not be nearly as impressed with us uh, as, as we want them to be, if they just really knew, if they really knew what I do and, and what I say, and boy, if they knew what we think about. Uh, and, and Psalm 139 uh, reveals to us, again, that the one, the one that we really have to deal with uh, does know us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. This is a Psalm of David. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will lay hold of me. God, we are reminded here that we... We don't, have to be, we don't have to fear being found out by you because we already are. And you know everything about us. You know what we've done. You know what we're capable of. You know what we're going to do. And before the foundation of the world, before we had uh, even existed, you chose us in Christ. You planned to redeem us, to adopt us as your sons and daughters, to draw us into your family, to allow your perfect son to die that, that we might become in him your sons and daughters. And so, God, I thank you for the forgiveness and cleansing that is ours in Christ. I thank you that that the one who knows us best loves us the most. Again, because of who you are and your, your character, not because of ours. And so, God, we worship you this morning. And, God, I, I thank you for the reminder that we've just heard of, of what our sin is and, and the forgiveness that is available to us in Christ. And so, God, I, I do pray for, my, uh, that for those, everyone that's here, everyone that's listening, uh, everyone that will sometime listen to this. God, I pray that, uh, that you would give the gift of new life, that you would give the gift of faith, and that you would draw people to yourself. And for your sons and daughters, for my brothers and sisters in Christ, God, I pray that you would... Uh, <clears throat> that you would cause us to, uh, to believe the gospel in a fresh way and to be overwhelmed again uh, at the, the forgiveness that is ours and the, the great love that you have for us because of Christ. God, I, I pray for uh, folks here that are, are grieving, and I pray that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them uh, for uh, for those that are anxious, for those that have, um, that have test results coming, for those that have uh, surgeries and, 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 and procedures coming in the future, God, I pray that you would, that you would calm uh, their fears. I pray that you would uh, keep them from being anxious. And God, I, I thank you that we can rest in the fact that you are in control of all things. Uh, for those that uh, are in need of, <clears throat> of provision. Um, God, I pray that you would encourage them. I, I pray that they would see you uh, providing for them. And I pray that you would give us as a church family um, opportunities to provide for each other and, and that we could be uh, the, the hands and feet of Christ uh, to, to our brothers and sisters. God, I pray for, uh, for this church body and I pray that you would grow us. I pray that you would protect us from the evil one. I pray you'd protect us from our own sin. And God, I pray that you would use us in each other's lives. And I pray you would use us together uh, to draw other people to Christ. Um, God, we just um, commit ourselves to you. We thank you that we can come before you, uh, come before your throne now. And it's a throne of, of grace and mercy and help because of our high priest. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together and continue worshiping. We're going to sing. Uh
Bless the Lord, all you servants. It's to the tune of uh, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, and then remain standing for a praise chorus. we do this morning bless you 
bless you, our Lord. Um, we give to you blessing and honor and glory. I pray that you would uh, be pleased to receive that from us. Again, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you to turn with me to Psalm 134. The scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 134, verses 1 through 3. This is a song of ascents. Behold, bless the Lord. All servants of the Lord, who serve by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. God, I pray that you would teach us from your word. I pray that you would encourage your sons and daughters this morning. God, I pray that you would cause us to focus our attention on you. I pray that you would cause us to worship you more fully this morning. Again, we pray this uh, because of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Psalm 134, this three-verse psalm, is the 15th and last of 15 ascent psalms. Uh, these, again, are a collection of 15 psalms that were sung as Worshippers were traveling to Jerusalem uh, for the three main feast weeks of the year. And as they were traveling together to Jerusalem for temple worship, as they were gathering to worship in God's house, they would sing these psalms. And if you lived a long way from Jerusalem, uh, then those three times a year, as far as temple worship, that was it for you. you it, it, was a, it was a week to ten day journey each, each way. Uh, coming from Galilee, which is where half of the population of Israel would have come from for, uh, for the feast, or coming from further than that, but coming from Galilee, it was a week. It was five to six to seven days journey on each, each way, plus a, a week while you were there. So going once to the temple was a, uh, almost a month-long experience. So if you're going to go three times, you're not going the rest of the year And if you lived a, a distance away. And so you, you, had, you had three, two or three, three times to actually be in God's house, to actually have a sacrifice that was, that was, was given, that, uh, an offering that was sacrificed on your behalf, to, to have atonement made for your particular sins, you had that about three times a year. And so these songs, these psalms were sung, and, and the, the worshipers would sing these 15 psalms as they left their homes, as they made this long journey, as they entered Jerusalem, to have this time of worship. Now, this 15th Psalm, Psalm 134, is different than the other 14. This one's actually sung as they were leaving, as they're coming back home. This one was actually sung after they had been in Jerusalem for the, for the week, and they would make a a, a habit, if you would, of coming back by the temple, no matter where they had been in Jerusalem, where they were staying, and, and oftentimes because of the huge crowds, they actually had to stay outside of Jerusalem. And yet before they would leave to go back home, they would come back by the temple and, and see the temple again and, and, and maybe go through the courtyard, but, but, but probably not, just see it again. And we've all done that. You know, you've, you've gone somewhere and, and you've been somewhere and, 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 and for a time, and when it's time to leave, you, you, you kind of go back by and see something again, just you know, want to see it one, uh, one last time. And, and so they would go by the the, the temple, and oftentimes they would leave early, early, early in the morning, pre-dawn, in the dark. And as they were leaving, they would go by the temple and they would see the night shift. They would see the Levites and the priests who were in the temple at that time. And, and they would call out to them 
and the Levites and priests would, would call back uh, to them. And so this is a, a fitting end, if you would, to these 15 ascent psalms. It's a, a fitting end to this week of worship in and around the temple. Um, this short psalm acts really like an amen. It acts like a, uh, an ending, an amen at the end of a, a worship time. Actually, this short little psalm is, is made up of two parts. The first two verses are a call to worship, and the third verse is a benediction. So you have a call to worship in verses 1 and 2, and, and you have a benediction at the end. Uh, and what, what those do is they mark the beginning and end of a worship service. Uh, the call to worship. Uh, and, and we have a call to worship in this church, and we have a benediction at the end of the service. And... And I'll be honest with you, I grew, up in a, I grew up in a church tradition where we didn't necessarily have either one of those. Um, we, we didn't have a benediction, we had a closing prayer. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but a benediction is not a closing prayer. Uh, and we didn't have a call to worship, we just kind of got started. I don't, know, I don't know how we got started, but we just, we just got started. What a, what a call to worship does is a, a call to worship calls us to turn from fellowship. And y'all listen, there's great value in being able to fellowship with your brothers and sisters. There's great value to being in community, to being a part of a church family. There is value. There's value to coming and being here and, and, and encouraging each other and, 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 and finding out what to pray for each other and, and just talking with each other. And then the call to worship calls us to turn from that. And to turn from our, our greeting time and, and to turn from the, the, our, our agendas. The, oh, I, oh, I've got to say something to someone. Oh, I have a note here. I had to, I had to give it. To, to turn from that, the announcements are now over and, and the talk and chatter is now over. And the call to worship says, okay, now listen. It's time to focus our attention on worshiping God. It's a call to worship. Now, the benediction is a pronouncement of God's blessing on people. It is a call. It is calling on God, and it is God, it's an announcement, if you would, of God's blessing on his people, on his gathered worshipers as they leave, as they scatter, as they, as they leave being together, there is an announcement of God's blessing on his people. So the first two verses, this, this call to worship, this call. Here we go in verse, in verse 1. It starts off, Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord. This is the second of two psalms that start with behold. The last one was last week, uh, Psalm 133, and now Psalm 134. Behold, look, focus, pay attention. This is important. Don't miss this. That's what, that's what it means to start a, a, a statement with behold. Behold, look. Hear this. Behold, you servants of the Lord. You servants. So this is for servants of the Lord, especially those that are serving by night in the house of the Lord. The Levites and the priests, there were, there were the Levites and the priests, especially the younger ones, got to work the night shift in the temple, especially during the feast weeks. Now, the temple was always open, and there was always someone there. But during the feast weeks, there was a lot to be done. Now, there were priests in the temple that would be praying. Someone was in the temple praying throughout the night. Someone was in the temple singing throughout the night. Two of them, it says, it, it, it says here, th those who serve by night in, in verse 1, the actual word there for service, stand. Y'all, check out this job. Two of them stood in the doorway of the temple for the entire night and stood there and just stood. And that was serving the Lord and it was a, a, a type of security. It was also a type of, of, of keeping the, the priests that were in there safe. It was also a type of letting people know, if you need to come in, we're here, so come on. It's safe. It's safe to come in. And then, y'all, listen, there was a lot of work. 
At least during the feast weeks, there were these large ovens in the temple that had to be kept warm, and they were constantly throughout the night baking bread so that the showbread would be would be ready for the, the, the services that would go on throughout the entire day. And so there was a lot of, there was a lot of work going on there, and, and there was a lot of preparing for worship for the next day, and some of them were actually worshiped. So listen, what they were doing is they were working. And, and, and they're in, they're in there in the, in, the, in, the, in the temple, and they are working, and these pilgrims, these, these worship, as they're leaving, they see these folks, and they call out to them and they say, Be, uh, they say, behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We sang, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord. The call here is for the servants of the Lord, anyone who's serving the Lord, to bless the Lord. No, again, remember what they're doing. Some of, them are, some of them are scooping coals up into the oven, and at least one of them is off somewhere singing by himself, and somebody's praying, and there's no congregation there. And, 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 and they're doing this because they're working and they're, and they're getting ready for the, next, for the next day and they're preparing to lead worship. And the call here is worship God then. Worship God right now. As you're working, as you're preparing, as you're serving, as you're doing the nursery, as you're teaching Sunday school, as you're serving, as you're getting ready to lead worship. And y'all, I can tell you, it's hard to worship when you're leading worship. Because you're worried about leading worship. It's hard to worship. It's hard to worship. It's hard to learn. It, it, when, when you, it, it's, hard, it's hard to pay attention. It's hard to sing. Seth, give me an amen. It's hard to sing when you're trying to keep up with the thing and, and change it. And, and so while you're doing all these things to serve, worship the Lord. Bless the Lord. Now, we use this, the, the, this word to bless. The word here actually means to kneel. It means to kneel. It means to kneel before someone that you, it actually means to kneel before someone you should kneel before. To, to bless means to kneel in front of somebody you should kneel in front of. In other words, to know who that person is, to know who you are compared to that person, and to respond correctly. The word here to bless is to think accurately about someone and respond accordingly. Let me say that again. To bless means to think accurately about someone and to respond accordingly. So the call here in worship is to bless the Lord, to think accurately about the Lord and to respond accordingly, to think accurately about who God is, about God's character, about God's attributes, about what is true of God, to think about, to think accurately about what God has done. Specifically here, at the end of the, uh, the, end of the psalm, uh, the, his work of creation, his work of sustaining the universe, his works of sovereignly ruling throughout history, his work of redeeming a people to himself that he has chosen. To bless is to think accurately about the Lord and about what he has done in and for me. He's actually given me new life. He took someone who was dead in his sins and made me alive together with Christ. He, he took someone and gave them the gift of faith and gave them the gift of repentance and gave us the He gave you and me in Christ the gift of, of justification, the gift of forgiveness. And y'all listen, those are costly gifts. They cost the life of his perfect son, he has called you and me to himself in Christ. So to bless the Lord is to think accurately about God and then to respond accordingly. To bless is to think accurately about someone and respond accordingly. So to respond, how do you respond? Verse 2, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Lift up your hands. Talking about a posture of worship. 1 Timothy 2.8 says to raise and lift holy hands to the Lord. Lifting your hands in worship was 
a common posture of prayer for the ancient Hebrews. And when they would pray, they would lift their hands. Lifting your hands as part of your worship of God is an act of surrender. It is especially an act of surrender if you lift your hands when you are in the position of kneeling, which is what the word bless means, to kneel before someone you should kneel before. When you kneel, when you, when you, when you somehow bow down, when you get down, I can't do it, my knees hurt, when you get down and you have your hands down and you have your, hand, have your, me, your head down and your hands up, that is a posture of that's a posture of surrender. It's a posture of being overwhelmed by who God is and what God has done. It is a posture of being all struck. We sang a praise song or a psalm a week or two ago, and it talked about God's awful throne. God's awful throne. And there was some discussion with the worship team on whether we should change that to all psalm. Because awesome sounds good. All full sounds bad. All full means full of all. Awful. And God is awful. Now, we, if you say, oh, that sounds terrible. Let's, okay, let's go with awesome then. All right? And, 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 we, and we use awesome for everything. We use awesome for everything. Awesome means it fills us with all. And we are awestruck at who God is and what he has done, and our response is surrender. It was Isaiah's response in Isaiah 6. When God gives Isaiah a vision of his glory in heaven, and Isaiah sees the throne room of heaven and sees the one on the throne, and, and his, response is, his response is, I am undone. I'm ruined. I'm a dead man. I'm undone. I, 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 I can't be here like this. It is a posture of surrender it's also listen it's a posture of supplication of asking i need you i need you it is the listen it is the it is the posture of a small child when they are around a parent a small child gets around their parent they put their hands up they put their hands up what are they saying they're saying they're saying pick me up pick me up they're saying carry me they're saying i need you they're saying see me if you have a bunch of kids, they're saying, see me. You know, they, they, put, their, they put their hands up. And, they, and I, I need you. It's a posture of being expectant. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody with their hand out. But you can kind of tell they have their hand out. Listen, because they're hoping slash expecting you to put something in their hand. In fact, we call that a handout. If you put something in their hand, which is out, we call that a handout. When you put your hands out to God in worship, when you lift your hands, what you're saying is, God, I need you to bless me. And you know what? Because you say you will, I, I trust you to do this. In fact, a benediction, a benediction is a pronouncement of God's blessing on God's people. The pastor in giving the benediction, is supposed to put his hands up. A benediction is not a closing prayer. It is God's blessing spoken through a man to God's people. The proper posture for receiving the benediction is to have your hands out. And this might be really, really, really weird at the end of our service today. But I'm going to remind you of that, and we're going to try this. Because the, pro, the, the posture is, see, because I think a lot of times we have this idea that, yeah, okay, God said it. I believe it. It might happen. God said it, and it might happen means I'm saying God might be lying. If God, who is God, cannot lie, then if God said, I will do this, then he will do this. And so it is a pronouncement of God's blessing on God's people. And the proper response is to, 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 to lift your hands and to say, okay, God, I can't do this for me. I can't, I can't bless me. I need you to bless me. So what we have here is we have in the first two verses, we have a call to worship. A call to worship. Behold, focus, bless, think about God and respond correctly. 
Worship, lift your hands, pray, sing, lift your hands. All you servants of the Lord, while you're preparing for worship, while you're getting the family ready and and telling them to jump in the van and hurry up, we're going to be late. It's a chance to worship. While you're speeding to get here on time, it's a chance, I don't know how you do that, it's a chance to worship. When you're herding all the little cats into their Sunday school room, it's a chance to worship. It's a chance to worship. When you're preparing to worship, it's a chance. While you're doing your job, when you leave here and go to your homes, it's a chance to, it's a chance to worship. While you're working, worship. Hang with me. The worshipers are leaving. The worshipers are leaving. They're leaving the, the, the temple. They're leaving the temple area. And, and most of them only get, only get to the temple every, you know, every three or four months. So they're really basically visitors. And they're talking to the guys that are always there. And as they're, as they're leaving, they're saying to the guys that are always there, Hey guys, hey guys, who are always here, keep doing your job, man. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be here for four months. So what I really need you to do is keep doing your job. Keep praying. Keep representing God's people to God. Keep offering sacrifices for God's people while I'm not here. I need you, I need you to keep doing I need you to keep worshiping in God's presence because I'm not going to be here for a while. Praise God, Hebrews 4 through 10 tells us we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. He, does no, he, he no longer continually offers sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins because he has once for all offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. And he has now sat down at the right hand of God. First John 2 tells us we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is seated next to the Father, and He is representing us. These guys had to say to the the night shift, hey hey guys, if you would talk to the day shift, and if y'all would keep doing your thing, you know, I'll be back in three or four months, and and really please keep worshiping God here in in His physical presence. Keep representing. We have a high priest. When when we pray in Jesus' name, it's not just a cool way to say amen. It's a reminder that the only way we can come before his throne and find it a throne of grace and mercy and help is because of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 3, the the, the priests respond with a benediction. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. A pronouncement of God's blessing on his people. May the Lord bless you. And remember what blessing is. To bless is to think accurately about somebody and then respond accordingly. So what's it mean when God blesses us? God thinks accurately about you and me, and then he responds accordingly. God thinks accurately about you and me. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Before there's a word on my tongue, you know it. God has no problem thinking accurately about you and me, about our sinfulness, about our bent towards certain sins, about our weaknesses, about our fears, about our insecurities, about our worries, about our griefs, about our loneliness, about our anxious thoughts, about our neediness. I don't know if you've ever referred to somebody as needy. Oh, yeah, they're they're a little needy. That's what God knows about you and I. And he responds to that accordingly. He chastises and he disciplines and he forgives and he cleanses and he gives assurance of his forgiveness. And he restores fellowship with us over and over and over again. And he heals. He physically heals and he strengthens and he comforts and he encourages and he provides And he protects and he promises all of those things for everyone who is in Christ, either here or with him forever. He responds accordingly to what he knows about us. This benediction here, may the Lord bless you 
from Zion. As you leave Zion, as you leave God's house, as you leave God's house this morning, as you leave having been gathered with God's people this morning, may the Lord bless you from being here. May the Lord bless you from being gathered together with his people in his house to worship him. As you go back to your homes, as you go back to work, as you go back to the week, may the Lord bless you, the Lord who made heavens, made the heavens and the earth, the sovereign creator, sustainer God of the universe. May he bless you. Listen to what God is actually saying to you. I am your God. I have called you to myself and you're mine. So as you go to your homes, as you go to your jobs, as you go out into the world, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I know you and I still love you. Because of Christ, you are mine, and I bless you. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you allow us to worship you here together. God, I thank you for the the many night watchmen here, the, the, the folks that serve in so many different ways, security, and, and, and nursery and, 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 and teaching and leading and playing and, and, and doing recreation and cooking food and, and, and cleaning and so many things, and leading. So many different things that folks do here, God. And I pray that you would, you would allow us to do those things with great joy and, and it, could, it would actually be worshiping you at the same time we get to do those things. And to serve in that way. And God, I pray for each of us that are in Christ, God, as we serve you. and As we leave here this morning, as we go uh, back home and and back to work and and, and back to the week. God, I pray that, that you would bless your sons and daughters. And I pray that you would cause us to bless you. And to be a blessing to you. And to think accurately about who you are and to respond accordingly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, let's stand and we'll sing hymn 141, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. For a thousand tongues to sing my dear Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of reigning sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the sinful clean, his blood availed for me. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. All right, beloved. There's blessings from our great Creator God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.